Hello and welcome to ICMDA webinars. I'm Dr. Peter Saunders, the Chief Executive of the International Christian Medical and Dental Association. And today we are privileged to have Gordon MacDonald from Care Not Killing, who'll be speaking to us on opposing the legalization of euthanasia. ICMDA brings together about 60,000 Christian doctors and dentists from around the world from 107 affiliated movements. Well, uh, it's a real pleasure to have with us Dr. Gordon MacDonald today from Care Not Killing. Euthanasia and assisted suicide are increasingly being legalized in Western countries. And this talk's going to look uh, at the impact of this prioritization of autonomy and choice within healthcare at vulnerable people being placed at risk as a result and how the number of deaths quickly escalates once the law has been changed. Dr. Gordon McDonald is the chief executive of Care Not Killing, uh, which brings together about 20 different organizations opposed to the legalization of uh, euthanasia and assisted suicide. Some of those, but not all of those organizations are Christian. And one of them is the Christian Medical Fellowship, a member of ICMDA. Gordon's held the post of chief exec since April, 2019. And prior to that, he worked in political advocacy focusing on the Scottish Parliament. In that role, he, care, he chaired Care Not Killing Scotland Committee, which led the campaign against two previous bills, which sought to legalise euthanasia and assisted suicide in the Holyrood Parliament. Gordon has a PhD in, in political economy and has been active in politics in a personal capacity for a number of years. Care Not Killing was set up in 2006 as a political campaign by a number of organisations which were concerned by Lord Joffe's attempt to change the law to legalise assisted suicide through his assisted dying for the terminally ill bill. And uh, Care Not Killing also campaigns for improvements in palliative care. Gordon has overseen the development of the organisation, including the establishment of the Our Duty of Care campaign, a campaign for health professionals who wish to oppose the legalisation of assisted suicide and euthanasia. Gordon, it's a real pleasure to have you back here on uh, ICMDA webinars, and we really look forward to hearing what you have to say. Thanks, over to you. Thank you, Peter. Um, I'll just try and share my screen here. Um, I, I should say that before I took on this role, um, I worked very closely with Peter, who was, of course, the, the campaign director um, for Care Not Killing, as well as his previous role um, with the Christian Medical Fellowship. So it's a great pleasure, Peter, to, to be here with you as well. Yeah, okay, so fine. I want to address the issue today of a growing um, political phenomenon, really, in, the, in Western Europe and North America and Australasia as well, um, which is the legalisation of assisted suicide and or euthanasia. Uh, and it's important that, uh, that we, we as are aware of the developments that are happening in this and what the impact will be once the law is changed, because there are very strong um, advocacy groups, very well-funded advocacy groups internationally pushing this um, political agenda, and it will impact medicine and change medicine throughout the, the whole um, the whole of those societies where these, this law is introduced. So first of all, just to go on to some Christian principles. Um, a, uh, as Peter said, CNK is not explicitly a Christian organization. We work with organizations of different faiths and none. Um, however, um, personally, I'm a Christian. And so um, I thought it'd be helpful in this context of the IC. Um, MDA to, to set out a basic um, Christian position on human life, um, which is that um, human life is, sac is sacred, it's the, uh, it's the sanctity of human life made in the image of God, um, dependent upon him, which means that there are limits on human autonomy um, and ultimately we're accountable to God. There is a duty to preserve life until its natural end. Um, with a prohibition on taking life, which implies that we must also preserve it, whilst recognising the inevitability of physical death um, for us all. 
And then there's a duty to relieve suffering and pain and care for the sick and the elderly. And so we have seen Christians being at the forefront of the development of palliative care um, throughout its history and continue to be very active in providing it today. Um, that's been the case in certainly in the UK and I'm sure in, in other countries as well. And the reason this is important, particularly the first bullet point there, is because the inherent and intrinsic value of all human life is the basis of all human rights legislation, which was developed after the Second World War and codified in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and then in subsequent um, uh, instruments such as the European Convention of Human Rights or the International Covenant in, on Civil and Political Rights. So that inherent dignity and inherent value of all human beings is the foundation, the foundation principle really um, of uh, international law. And it's important that we understand the, the origins of that really. Next, we need to consider what euthanasia is on, and assisted suicide. And there are various forms of euthanasia. First of all, there's voluntary euthanasia, where the life of somebody is ended um, at their own request. Um, so they have, they have asked for it, um, often by a doctor, although no, not necessarily requires medical involvement. Then there's involuntary euthanasia, where someone's life is terminated and they haven't made any such request. Uh, that may well be um, uh, that the, the doctor has decided that um, this person's life is no longer worth living um, and they act on their own initiative rather than the patient's initiative. And then there's non-voluntary euthanasia where the life of someone um, is ended and they're not competent to make the request either because of advanced dementia or because they're in a coma. Um, for whatever reason, they're unable to make that request. And then assisted suicide is where one person directly and intentionally um, is involved with ending the life of another person but doesn't administer the drug themselves. So, for example, a doctor writing a prescription for a lethal dose of barbiturates. Obviously, with euthanasia, the doctor is actively involved in administering the drugs uh, there isn't really any distinction morally between assisted suicide and euthanasia for doctors, um, but there is a difference in terms of actual practice. Now, here's a quote from Peter Saunders um, in an article that he wrote um, a few years ago, um, which I thought was quite interesting, again, particularly within this context of, of Christian medicine. In cultures that believe in an afterlife, the fear of what might happen after death is understandably very real. But in cultures like our own, as in the UK or Western societies, increasingly dominated by atheism, the fear of the dying process has become the main focus. And I think that's quite insightful because the consequence of that shift in the culture is that the emphasis is placed upon the quality of human life rather than its sanctity. And if we place the emphasis on quality of life rather than the inherent dignity of every human being, then ultimately we are in danger of undermining the very human rights framework which we all rely upon. So the first point to really note about this debate is that it, become, it boils down essentially to a debate between those who wish to prioritize autonomy um, versus those who prioritise public safety or the common good of the whole of society. And particularly those who are arguing for a change in the law would hold up autonomy, individual autonomy, to be the ultimate human good, the ultimate social good. And therefore, on that basis, they would argue that there is a right for any individual to decide when one's life should end and what assistance should be given if that if their life is deemed by them by the patient to be intolerable it's important to note of course that intolerable which is written into laws in various um, jurisdictions is a very subjective concept so it's difficult to have an objective test other than whether or not the patient has a particular medical condition um, to 
to justify or to, to rationalise why euthanasia or assisted suicide is being offered. It really boils down to the subjective experience of each and every patient as to whether or not they believe that their condition is so severe that it is no longer tolerable on their part. So that then leads to a, a danger of value judgments being made by third parties about the lives of people who have, for example, disabilities or who are chronically or terminally ill. Because although in principle it's the patient that makes the decision, in practice, particularly in jurisdictions where euthanasia is legalised, there are many other people involved in the process. And you may well have third parties, whether they be healthcare professionals or others, um, family members or others, um, coming to their own view and in some way applying that view or, or putting some pressure upon the patient based on the fact that they consider that this person's life is essentially um, of less value than an able-bodied person's life. Many people, for example, um, probably around 25% or more of people who have a terminal illness will also be clinically depressed. And if we look at the experience in Oregon, where assisted suicide has been legalized since 1998, currently only about 1% of physician-assisted suicide cases um, will um, be referred for psychiatric evaluation. Now, so that results essentially in about 60 people a year on the current numbers who should be being referred for psychiatric evaluation because of um, depressed mood. Um, but who are not receiving that prior to their um, su assisted suicide being completed. And then there's the issue of elder abuse, which is on the increase. And so the WHO has recently stated that nearly 17% of over 60s will have experienced some form of abuse in the last um, 12 months. So the second issue then is how do we protect people who are in a vulnerable situation or the public safety issue? And what we see in those jurisdictions where euthanasia in particular has been legalised is that both involuntary and non-voluntary euthanasia occur, but also, uh, in some jurisdictions at least, that continuous deep sedation becomes frequent practice. And this is where very high levels of sedation of drugs are used to sedate the patient, not with the intent of alleviating the symptoms, but rather with the intent ultimately of ending the life of the patient. Physician-assisted suicide or euthanasia are far cheaper, of course, than providing health or social care. So there are two academics recently, um, Alex Shaw and David Morton in, in 2020, who wrote a paper and they described the cost savings to the National Health Service in the UK as the elephant in the room in the debate. Essentially, what they said was that this is a factor that needs to be considered in the debate, although they were... Uh, 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 quick to caveat, they were not arguing that that is the reason why the law should change. Obviously, they were arguing that the law should change, but they were not arguing that it should be just to save money. Nevertheless, they highlighted that this is part of the debate that should be considered. And, of course, um, those campaigners who were in favour of the law um, changing were very quick to distance themselves from that article. Individuals and families also can be tempted by financial pressures um, because of the cost of care, um, to opt for either assisted suicide or euthanasia. So Marie Curie, which is a cancer um, charity in the UK, have estimated that the cost of living with a terminal illness in the UK would be, be, be between twelve and £16,000 per annum. And that, um, of course, that has to be set against um, the costs of care home for those who are not terminally ill, um, which would be much higher, perhaps £1,500 per week for those living with advanced dementia. So these are the cost pressures that families face. Um, and the, the question then is, can individual family financial circumstances, particularly in the, in the context of a cost of living crisis and high inflation, um, impact people's decision making and push people towards either assisted suicide or euthanasia? Then there's the issue of fear of being a burden, which has been increasingly cited as a reason for assisted suicide deaths in Oregon. Um, the average over five years between 2018 and 2022 was 53% of those who had an assisted suicide in Oregon 
um, the fear of being a burden on either family or friends or the health services were, was one of the reasons that they, they sought an assisted suicide. Not the only reason, but one of the reasons. The, the percentage fell slightly in 2023. However, over time, the percentage has gone up. Um, and so it's now regularly over 50%. And then loneliness is another reason that people seek um, assisted death. And in Canada, 17% of medical assistance in dying cases, loneliness is one of the reasons cited. Of course, these are not the only reasons, but, but it's, it's important that we are, understand that people have multiple reasons and many of them are social. Then the third point really is, is that the slippery slope is inevitable because if you base your decision to change the law on autonomy and compassion, then these arguments can be applied widely. And if you see assisted suicide or euthanasia, euthanasia as a health care right, then that needs to be available to all. And you, you can't discriminate in terms of the provision of health care. So what then happens over time is that the law gets expanded from applying to those who are terminally ill to those who are chronically ill. It gets expanded from adults to include children. It gets expanded from people who are mentally competent to include people who are mentally incompetent. And those with serious illness, with serious illnesses to include potentially just people who are elderly and have multiple minor conditions and are either um, tired of life or completed life, I think, is the terminology that's being used in the Netherlands in relation to this debate. And then the other thing we see is we see in every jurisdiction a huge increase in the number of deaths year on year. Now, if euthanasia is legalized, the level of deaths is much higher than if it's assisted suicide. But nevertheless, the trend is the same in all jurisdictions. We see that proposed safeguards don't work. They're very quickly seen as barriers to access and so are removed or watered down and they don't last and they aren't safe. And conscientious objection rights of medical staff and others are threatened. So, for example, in Canada, because so few doctors are actually willing to administer medical assistance in dying and there's a two-stage process uh, and because so many people have been asking for it, um, other doctors who don't want to participate are now finding that they're going to be forced to do so in the first um, stage of the process in order to uh, improve access um, to the service. And this is what we see happen is it, this is where conscientious objection gets seen as a barrier to the provision of what is seen as a healthcare right. And so um, medical practitioners come under um threat of, of um, some sort of discipline within their profession if they are unwilling to make it available. And then suicide prevention is undermined. Um, some lives are deemed to be worth saving um, and others are deemed to be worth assisting suicide. Some lives are worth more than others, in other words, in public policy. So I'm looking at the current proposals in the British Isles, there are, there are four or five different attempts to legalise assisted suicide in different places um, and euthanasia as well. So, But the, the headline points are that we see both assisted suicide and euthanasia being proposed for patients with terminal and chronic illnesses and doctors and nurses both involved in administering it in in the proposals in Jersey. Elsewhere, particularly in the, the proposals in Scotland, where, I, where I'm based, there is no prognosis of death required. So in, in, in previous bills, there's been an expectation or that there would be a, an imminent death within perhaps six months, and that would be written into the law. This time around, that's not being proposed, which means that patients might have um, you know, six months, the amount of 12 months, the amount of five years to live, but would all qualify equally for an assisted suicide. Doctors will be allowed to intervene with an emergency IV if the drugs don't work and the patient doesn't die or if they start vomiting or um, having fits or seizures. But it's not clear as to what the purpose of this would be. Um, when the proposer of the bill was asked this, um, would it be to 
resuscitate the patient or would it be to finish the job and kill the patient? He said he would just leave it up to the doctor's um, discretion. So what's being proposed is essentially will be vague and unclear in law, which will be ripe for a legal challenge very quickly thereafter. And the law is unlikely to stand if that's what it contains. Doctors and healthcare staff who conscientiously object would be required to refer um, the patient to another practitioner who would facilitate the death. And obviously that may well impinge upon conscience rights and people's um, faith or non-faith conscience conscientious objections. Hospices and care homes couldn't opt out, uh, so they would have to facilitate euthanasia or assisted suicide on their premises, even if they were religious um, or whether they just, even with, as, as secular hospices, they might um, have a, an ethical objection based on the, the definition of palliative care, which is neither to hasten nor um, no prolonged death. There's proposals to have Zoom or online Teams consultations with patients in order to ensure equality of access around the whole of the country, particularly for people in rural areas, which, which raises the question as to whether the doctor will actually know anything about the patient or their family circumstances. How will the doctor be able to ensure that there's no coercion taking place? Um, or that the patient isn't depressed. There's no requirement for psychiatric assessment. There's only an option being proposed. Two doctors um, are involved in signing off the decision to end the life of the patient or help the patient end their own life. But it's suggested that there's only one year of post-graduation experience required for that, uh, which leads to quite a lot of um, shock uh, amongst my uh, medical colleagues when they hear that for the first time. And then doctors can raise the subject of assisted suicide. Um, and indeed, there is a suggestion from some of our medical colleagues that under current GMC guidance, um, they might be required to raise the subject of assisted suicide with any eligible patient because of a recent court case that went to our UK Supreme Court where, where essentially afterwards the GMC published guidance saying that all healthcare options um, had to be presented to the patient. So in the past, proponents for assisted suicide have pointed to Oregon in the United States as the example that they wish to follow. Although in many other countries around Europe now, such as Spain and Portugal, um, the, the Dutch type or Canadian type of euthanasia laws have actually been introduced. However, if um, considering the proposal to have assisted suicide laws, um, what has happened more recently is that the, the campaigners for a change in the law have now shifted their focus away from North America towards Australia as an example to follow, and particularly the Australian state of Victoria now, if we look at what is the situation in Australia, although there's only been two or three years experience um, in Australia, so we are still um, trying to get the data really on how it's developing there. But there are more restrictions than is currently being proposed, for example, in the UK. So the law does allow both assisted suicide and euthanasia, but a six month prognosis is required um, a permit needs to be signed by the Secretary of the Department of Health, not by doctors. So it's not just doctors making the decision. There is some sort of a formal process beyond the doctors. The patient is required to try effective treatments for physical and psychological illness, which isn't required in other jurisdictions. Um, doctors are not allowed to bring up the subject or suggest it, which, as I've just mentioned, is not what's being proposed in the, certainly in the UK context and is unlikely to be in most other contexts as well. And there has, despite these more tight restrictions, there has nevertheless been a 9% increase in the general suicide rate um, in 2022 and a 32% increase in the over 65s. And the reason that is significant is because the argument which really swung the politicians in Victoria was that 50 
people a year with terminal illness were committing suicide and therefore the law should be changed to legalise and regulate assisted suicide in order to address that issue of um, terminal suicides. However, the data suggests, despite it only being available for two or three years, that that um, argument is fallacious. And in fact, the general suicide rate has increased. Certainly, the suicide rate over the 60 of over 65s has increased. And it would appear also that the suicide rate of people with terminal illness has increased as well. And if you look at the overall number of euthanasia and assisted suicide deaths in Victoria, we see that there has been a rather large and rapid increase in the number of deaths in, in just three years, uh, representing a, a, an increase of 146%. The reason I mention Victoria is because Victoria is held up as being different from all the other jurisdictions. But if we then look at the other jurisdictions where this is, has been around for longer, we see that the same increase in deaths occurs everywhere. So at the top there, you have the Netherlands, which has got a euthanasia regime and has been, you know, has had that in force for perhaps the longest period of time of all the jurisdictions. And you can see how the death rate from euthanasia, largely from euthanasia, but also assisted suicide has gone up year on year over time with a small dip in 2015. Uh, and in fact, the, the rate of increase has has increased itself over time as well. Then you have Belgium, uh, again with a rise, Switzerland with an, a rising rate, and then Oregon at the bottom, which although that looks more, more um, flat-lined, um, when you look at the data for Oregon, you see that the, 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 the numbers have gone up in Oregon as well. So in looking at the specific numbers then in Belgium, uh, the law was presented as being only for exceptional cases. It was argued that euthanasia was happening anyway and that this would regulate it, bring it into the light, and that, that it would be safer as a result. But in fact, when you look at the numbers over time, you can see how rapidly it has increased from 2002 when the law was introduced um, to this status up to 2021. And there was a study in... 2013 in Belgium, in Flanders, uh, where they looked at physician-assisted deaths, uh, and they found that the 6.3% of all deaths annually were physician-assisted. Of that, 4.6% of all deaths were from euthanasia, 0.05% from assisted suicide, and 1.7% where the death was hastened without the explicit request from the patient. So in other words, um, non-voluntary euthanasia. Now, probably that's people who are in a coma or have got advanced dementia or people who are, are not able at that point in time of making um, the request. But nevertheless, it's a worrying trend. There's been one study recently on Belgium, Raus et al., and they came to three conclusions uh, in their study. One is that physicians diagnose polypathology and assortment of minor medical problems and that that is used as sufficient criteria for euthanasia of the elderly, despite the fact that that's not what the Belgian law allows. So that would appear to be illegal in the Belgian context, but nevertheless is happening. Secondly, that the treating physician can override consultants' objections to euthanasia. So the treating physician has to get second opinions but they don't have to pay attention to what the second opinion is. They can just set that aside. And thirdly, that the Oversight Commission, which monitors euthanasia, has conflicts of interest and is fraught with ethical contradictions. Now, this came out in the case of Morty versus Belgium, which CNK intervened in. Tom Mortier's mother um, was euthanized. She had long-term depression. Her own psychiatrist said that she didn't qualify under the Belgian law but the doctor who euthanized her saw other psychiatric views um, and eventually um, found somebody who agreed that she did qualify. So she was euthanized, and Tom only found out um, the day afterwards that she had died uh, when the hospital rang him up and told him that his mother was dead and could he um, arrange for her remains to be removed. <laughs> 
This led to complaints to the authorities, which were not properly investigated over a number of years. And eventually the case ended up in the European Court of Human Rights, which found that a breach of the right to life had occurred, specifically in relation to the post-mortem procedures and the lack of a proper independent investigation. But nevertheless, there were also concerns raised during the case about the um, behaviour of the Oversight Commission, because one of the doctors involved actually sat um, on that oversight commission. And then another point about Belgium to bear in mind, and the same is true, I think, in the Netherlands, is that the data we have is probably not the full picture because we're dependent upon doctors self-reporting and nearly half um, of euthanasia deaths in Belgium are not reported. A similar high number in the Netherlands, although it's not as high as in Belgium. If you look at Switzerland, which has an assisted suicide system rather than euthanasia, although it doesn't just apply to people with terminal illness, you see again how quickly the numbers have started to increase. And the point about all these graphs is, is that they sh they, there's no sign of a plateauing happening. So if there was a fixed level of demand for assisted suicide or euthanasia, we'd expect perhaps the numbers to go up a bit to begin with and then to plateau off. But that's not what has been happening the numbers have kept increasing over time and are still increasing. Um, if we look at Oregon, um, as I said, in Oregon, there, uh, there are um, concerns about psychiatric evaluation or not lack of it in many cases. But we are dependent upon doctors self-reporting. And so it's so when our uh, campaigners for the a change in the law say, well, there's no problems being reported in Oregon, that's not hugely surprising because it's unlikely that a doctor is going to report that they didn't abide by the law or they, or they bent the rules in some way. Um, as I mentioned already, only 1% of patients are currently having um, a psychiatric evaluation. I think it was about 3% over the whole period since 1998, but the current levels are about 1% annually. Deaths have quadrupled in the last 10 years or so. Uh, the number of government health-funded patients has now increased, has doubled. Um, so in the past, at the beginning, it was mainly people who would have been fairly well off, who were fairly articulate, who were seeking assisted suicides. But increasingly, we see that people on government welfare or health funding programs are accessing assisted suicide. And one in 12 of them cite financial concerns as one of their reasons. Um, the time of doctor-patient relationship has been reduced by two-thirds over time. And we have seen various drug cocktails being used with no adequate research or safeguards um, in terms of the practice there. And indeed, there's, there are um, questions being raised in some quarters about the, the effects of these drug cocktails as well on people. And then we see law and practice has been have expanded. So a recent court case in Oregon allowed the law to be applied to non-residents. So it can now apply to anybody from any of the 50 states in the USA. Um, the 15-day waiting period, which was put in to ensure that people um, who might have a transient wish to die and might change their mind would be protected, can be waived in certain circumstances by the doctor if he thinks the death might be more imminent than that. Um, and refusal of treatment, which will in itself lead to death, is now deemed to be a qualifying criteria. In other words, it's deemed to be terminal. So f there have been cases of people with severe anorexia um, who are refusing, obviously, any further treatment, um, who qualify as being terminally ill on that basis. So if you look at the data in Oregon, you see the number of prescriptions has gone up year on year, which is the top line there and the number of assisted suicide deaths has gone up as well. And there's a gap of about a third um, or 30% between the number of prescriptions issued and the number um, that are actually, uh, of deaths that actually occur, assisted suicide deaths that actually occur. The good thing about Oregon is that they do collect quite a lot of data and publish it on an annual basis. And so we have... Um, fairly detailed understanding of the reasons why people seek an assisted suicide death in Oregon. The overwhelming majority of those reasons are social or existential in some way, um, fear of pain or 
inadequate pain relief is in fact only cited in about 33% of cases. So it is the loss of control or the loss of autonomy um, that tends to drive people to opt for assisted suicide or the fear of it in particular. Um, and I did hear a, a palliative care doctor from Australia speaking at a conference recently, a medical conference recently here, and her final point was that fear is what drives people for seeking an assisted suicide. But there are, of course, other ways to address these problems, particularly through palliative care, but also through social support and social care um, and companionship. And the fear of being a burden, as I say, has been cited in Oregon more than 50% of um, times in recent cases. It's gone up over time, although it's gone up and down from year to year as a, as a reason that's, that's given. So there was a case in Oregon, Barbara Wagner, a few years ago, 2008, she had cancer. She asked her health insurance company for um, financial support. And uh, they said they wouldn't treat her, give her chemotherapy or fund her chemotherapy, but they would fund her assisted suicide. If you look in the Netherlands, where about 4.5% of deaths are as a result of euthanasia. But if you add on other physician-induced deaths through, um, uh, through uh, continuous deep sedation, we end up with more than 25% of deaths in the Netherlands being um, initiated by the physician in some way or another. And the point about continuous deep sedation deaths in the Netherlands is that the, not, the percentage has increased over time. So in 2001, we were talking about 5.6% of all deaths. By 2017, it was 22.6% of all deaths. Canada uh, is perhaps the most extreme example of of euthanasia in the world. The law was introduced for those who are, whose death was deemed to be reasonably foreseeable. That was that restriction was removed after a court case and it's been extended to, to um, people who have, whose death is not reasonably foreseeable. And the proposal is to include people who are solely suffering from severe irremediable mental health conditions from next year. There's also discussion about in including mature minors and disabled infants. There's been an increase in medical assistance in dying deaths in Canada by 367% over six years. Uh, it's higher if you include the, the previous six months um, for 2016, since when the law was introduced, about 550% increase if you include those six months. 4.1% of all deaths nationally are from made now. It was 3.3% last year, 6.6% um, in Quebec, and in some other provinces it's probably, uh, or not, maybe not provinces, sorry, in some other places, cities and locations, it's probably higher. Only 23% of made patients saw a specialist palliative care consultant, so 77% didn't. And on a, if you look at the total number of deaths from made in Ontario, um, only three of them were by assisted suicide. The rest were all euthanasia. So it was the doctors that did the act of, of ending the life of the patient. And then one third of assisted deaths um, in Quebec are, are now by high dose sedation, which means, of course, that you don't have to go through the, the bureaucratic process of, of MAID. So the, in total, the death rate is about 8%, um, both from uh, MAID and sedation, and a third of that. 2.6% uh, is uh, of deaths is is through sedation. So, okay, so that's the data from Canada. You can see how rapidly the numbers have increased in Canada. Their latest figure is thirteen thousand two hundred forty-one for twenty twenty-two. It's probably gone up again in twenty twenty-three. And of course, in Canada, the, they have been more explicit about the cost savings. So a 2020 estimate from the Canadian Parliamentary Budget Office was that the cost savings to healthcare would be $175.7 million gross when you took off the cost of, in, uh, of implementing the MAIDs and, and running the MAID programme, it, ca it came down a bit, but that was a gross um, uh, cost saving. Um, and that was based on a death rate of 2% 
as I said, uh, the actual rate last year was 3.3% and it's, it's higher, it's 4.1% uh, uh, in 2022. And we've seen various cases hitting the headlines in Canada of people who are being inappropriately uh, offered, um, made or being um, asking for it. So this lady said that she was seeking it because of the, her inability to access support and care support. Um, then we had a veterans affairs worker in Canada who was offering assist, you know, medical assistance in dying to a, a Paralympian who was disabled and to a, a veteran, a veterans affairs uh, uh, who you know who was a, a a veteran and was suffering from PTSD. You have another lady who had a medical assistance in dying death again because she couldn't get. Um, the support that she needed. So people are dying, albeit um, uh, occasional cases, but people are dying for completely the wrong reasons, even under the Canadian law. And then we have Roger Foley here, who recorded um, a hospital administrator saying to him, well, you're costing $1,500 a day for your care. Um, we can't really provide that package. Would you, you know, have you considered medical assistance in dying? Uh, which is another famous case that's hit the headlines. So we're seeing more and more of these cases emerging in Canada. Um, and the reason that these cases are emerging is because medical assistance in dying has been brought in in a very medicalized context and it has become a norm uh, to offer it to for all sorts of um, uh, medical problems. Uh, admittedly, people have to have a severe illness, but as I think we've point, pointed out already, people can have multiple um, can, motivations for seeking a medical assistance in dying or um, may well have other conditions other than just the terminal or physical illness that they suffer from. And then the latest question then is child euthanasia, can child euthanasia ever uh, uh, be informed, can it ever involve informed consent, certainly on the part of the child. Um, in Belgium, we saw euthanasia being extended to include children aged under 12 in 2014. In the Netherlands, the Groningen Protocol allows for child euthanasia for severely disabled infants aged under 12 months. Um, and the Dutch government is planning to extend that protocol to include children aged 1 to 12 who've got um, terminal uh, illnesses. And then the Canadian Parliamentary Committee on MAID has um, heard evidence um, that mature minors it should be expanded to include mature minors. And also um, there was a particular um, lady who was petitioning the, the Canadian government and parliament to change the law so that her disabled child could um, have access to MAID as well. And the reason why that's so significant, I think looking at it from a historical perspective is, is that at you know, euthanasia is not new. It was being proposed, first proposed in the UK in 1936-37. Um, the, within the context of the whole eugenics movement in Europe and in, in North America. And the first child who was euthanized as part of the German euthanasia program um, was as a result of his parents approaching a doctor and saying, you know, that it would really be better for their child to be euthanized, um, similar to the Canadian story that we just heard about. And that doctor happened to be Hitler's personal physician, and he went to Hitler and he asked, and Hitler agreed to a physician, um, physician-assisted euthanasia um, for people with um, disabilities, children initially, but then later adults. And 23 doctors were put on trial in Nuremberg as a result when, you know, the, the, the world was horrified by what had developed from that. Interestingly enough, um, about 50% of them actually ended up being cleared at, the, at that trial. Um, and others were released early, ultimately, from, from prison. But the result was the, early, the, 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 the German euthanasia program led to 6,000 children being killed after a pediatric assessment. Um, the program was set up to administer it. And then ultimately, the official figures are about 70,000 adults being killed by 1941, although there are unofficial estimates that perhaps up to maybe a quarter of a million or more 
um, people were euthanized under that program. And the basis of it was the belief that some lives were not as valuable as others. Some lives were not as worthy to be lived as other people's lives were not as as useful. It was a very utilitarian view. And I think the danger that we see now, although obviously we are uh, euthanasia and assisted suicide are introduced as being about autonomy and consent, the danger is that that underlying worldview of that some lives are no longer worth living and are not in, of inherent value comes to drive um, drive what takes place, particularly within a context of budgetary constraints, perhaps, either in social care or in healthcare. But nevertheless, Carl Brandt, who was the doctor who, who initiated the whole thing, his comment after the, the war was, my underlying motive was the desire to help individuals who could not help themselves. If such considerations should not be regarded as inhuman, nor did I feel in any way to be unethical or immoral. I am convinced that if Hippocrates were alive today, he would change the wording of his oath, in which the doctor is forbidden to administer a poison to an invalid or even, even on demand. I have a perfectly clear conscience about the part I played in the affair. I'm perfectly um, content, I think, um, that when I said yes to euthanasia, I did so with the greatest conviction, just as it is my conviction today that it is right. And so it's very easy, I think, to convince ourselves um, that on grounds of compassion, that what we're doing is right. Of course, Leo Alexander, who was the chief prosecutor, was very clear that the, the, the beginnings, the origins, were a subtle shift in the views of doctors and the basic attitudes of doctors. It started with the attitude basic in the euthanasia movement that there's such a thing as a life not worthy to be lived. This attitude in its early stages concerned itself merely with the severely and chronically sick. And gradually the sphere of those to be included in this category was enlarged to encompass the socially unproductive, the ideologically unwanted the racially unwanted and finally all non-Germans. Now, of course, this is not to say that we will end up with uh, the same horrors happening in all of these jurisdictions, but I think it is important that we do learn the lessons as to how what happened in Germany in the 1930s and 40s started and are aware and watchful for the same sorts of attitudes perhaps re-emerging in our own day and age, particularly when we have as I say, potential for um, significant economic and other crises impacting us. And arguably, some of that may have, um, may have been evidenced during the COVID pandemic, certainly in the UK, where there is this current inquiry going on as to why some patients were discharged into care homes without being tested for COVID. And of course, that led to a particularly high death rate um, from COVID in those care homes. Um, so what are we doing? Well, we set up, as, as mentioned earlier, this Our Duty of Care campaign. It's based um, on, uh, essentially, we've, we've set that up because many of the medical bodies, such as the British Medical Association and the Royal Colleges, are adopting positions of neutrality. And it's to allow a, a home, really, for healthcare professionals who don't wish to um, uh, participate but also wish to take a clear stance against and it's, the, we have this declaration which is based upon the World Medical Association's declaration on euthanasia and assisted suicide um, which was reaffirmed in Tbilisi in October 2019 and what we're saying is is that we won't participate the doctors shouldn't be required um, and other healthcare professionals shouldn't be required required to participate. They shouldn't be obliged to make referral decisions to that end. Um, as it would undermine the public's trust in the healthcare profession. Um, and ultimately, the, the only safeguard is not to change the law at all, but rather um, to continue to prohibit assisted suicide and euthanasia and that we won't participate even if the law is changed to allow us to do so. So it's really um, to give people somewhere to go when various medical bodies are adopting positions of neutrality. Now, if you want to sign up to that or find out more, you can do so online at www.rgtfcare.org.uk. Okay, thank you. Thanks very much, Gordon, for that very comprehensive overview, uh, particularly what's happening in other parts of the world where they've gone down the route of legalizing assisted suicide or, or euthanasia.
So we've got a bit of time for questions now. Uh, I wanted to ask you first up, it's often argued by those who want to change the law that um, <clears throat> that a very modest change won't put vulnerable people at risk, as you've argued. So the, the, the argument often goes, well, it, if we make it only for adults, only for those who are mentally competent with uh, six years or six six months or or less to live, then surely can't it be controlled? What what does the evidence tell us about that? I think the main thing that controls, to be honest, is is um, if you don't legalise euthanasia. Um, quite frankly, I think the the law can be changed. No parliament can limit its successor. Um, as we've seen in Canada, the courts can very quickly say, well, this is discriminatory, it discriminates against this group of people who have as, as much suffering as this other group that qualify. Um, so I think there's no guarantee it can be provided that law, law will not be expanded, um, either because of a court decision or because of a future parliamentary decision. Um, but clearly, in terms of the numbers, uh, evidently, uh, an awful lot more people will die if you if you have euthanasia rather than assisted suicide. Now, in, in the UK, you've been fairly successful in stopping a change of the law up until this point. I think it's nearly 20 years of, of battling. What do you put that down to? Uh, does, has the UK learned any lessons to or any arguments to combat the change that could be used in other places? Well, I, I think I put it down primarily to um, a sort of legacy of a Christian value system, even amongst secular politicians, that, that says that we have to care about the vulnerable in our society, uh, particularly those on the political left. So the political left in the UK has been much more likely to be opposed than, for example, example similar parties in other, juris in other countries. But also, um, I think it's been due to the opposition, particularly of medical doctors, uh, groups like the British Medical Association in the past, and individual doctors as well. And so that's why we need doctors to be organised, to be informed, and to engage with politicians and to express their concerns, because politicians still want to hear what doctors have to say on this matter. Um, our frustration is, is that doctors don't feel that they are equipped to speak to politicians. I don't know why that should be, but that's what we pick up. And yet the politicians want to know what the doctors think. And uh, when, when the medical profession doesn't stand up against it, what, what happens? What can we learn from other jurisdictions where perhaps people have taken a different stand from the BMA? I think the law very quickly changed. So in Canada, the Canadian Medical Association went neutral. Um, that then was cited in uh, a court case in British Columbia, the Carter case, which then paved the way for the law to change in Canada because the court in Canada ruled that the, the ban on, on assisted suicide and euthanasia was unconstitutional. And I think if the Canadian Medical Association hadn't gone neutral, then it's it's perhaps less likely that the court would have given the ruling that it did and the, uh, we would have seen the development so quickly in Canada. It's a rapid pace of development in Canada over five or six years and how widely it has expanded that is the most shocking thing, really, and the, and the most clear evidence how of how dangerous any change in the law can be. You put up the quote at the end from Carl Brandt and uh, quite chilling in a way because... He's, he could have been anyone speaking in a contemporary context about you know being motivated by compassion as a doctor and seeing it as part of good medicine and so on. Do you think um, when the law changes, does something happen to the public or medical conscience that uh, people are able to tolerate things that they would have been horrified by just a few years earlier? I think people get used to a new law. And I think part of the issue in Western secular democracies now, which have become uh, obviously non-religious, is that the public in general, and I don't suppose the medical profession is any different, um, judge what is right and wrong, morally right and wrong, on the basis of what is legal and illegal. 
So if you change the law to make something legal, then then you're giving society sanction and saying that this is now um, something which is morally right, and therefore um, that changes the, the mindset. It changes people's view, uh, uh, and and so that I think is the danger for medicine. And I think we've seen that in the Netherlands, where uh, it's it's deemed to be normal and uh, widespread. Mm. And you've argued, you know, very strongly that once you change the law to allow any kind of euthanasia or assisted suicide, you get a, a, a strength, a, an extending of the boundaries, don't you? When you start with adults, then it's children. You start with terminal illness, then it's chronic illness. You start with physical illness, then it's mental illness. The, the other issue you raised, Gordon, about Canada was the undermining of conscience rights for, for doctors and, and also for institutions as well that there's a duty to either be involved or refer the patient on to to others would you like to to comment on that yeah i mean there was a case with uh, a hospice in british columbia that had its um contract essentially withdrawn from the local health authorities because they were unwilling to um facilitate medical assistance in dying famous case mm. of the delta hospice society um, Belgium has changed the law there recently too to require um, hospices and care homes um, to facilitate um, euthanasia um, and certainly to prevent them from disciplining any of their of their staff that might wish to participate, even if it's against the ethos of the care home. So I think we are seeing a, a, a slow um, infringement upon freedom of conscience as a result. Uh, and of course, the, in the UK context, the only case law on freedom of conscience, um, which was a, to do with an abortion case, um, the UK Supreme Court ruled that that conscience clause needed to be interpreted in a very narrow way, so that you had to be directly involved in the process in order for the conscience clause to apply. Uh, mm. And if you apply that in the context of euthanasia, then you know all sorts of people who will be involved in the process will find that they, they don't have any option but to participate. Are not protected, yeah. And I guess, uh, and the big lesson from that is uh, oppose any change in the law because once you allow even a chink, then you've inevitably got uh, a slippery slope and incremental extension to the kind of horrific situations, really, that we're now seeing in places like Canada and the state of Victoria. Well, I'm afraid that's all we've got time for today, but uh, thanks. Thanks so much, uh, Dr. Gordon MacDonald, for coming and speaking to us on opposing the legalisation of euthanasia from the experience that you've had in the UK and indeed all around the world. It just remains to me to uh, to give thanks to all of you for coming along and joining in ICMDA webinars. We look forward to seeing you again soon. May the Lord bless you.